Life is complicated, unpredictable, and always changing. What always worked yesterday doesn't always work tomorrow. What you thought you had figured out doesn't always work out. Or just when you thought you had all the answers dialed in, you suddenly realized in a moment of failure, you don't have a clue. No matter who you are or where you live, one thing remains the same. Life happens. And when it does, it rarely sends an email letting you know. Work, money, relationships, parenting, marriage, adversity, career path, future plans, your life and your legacy are directly connected to the decisions you make in response to life's challenges and opportunities. Which is why, more than anything, you need wisdom. Wisdom you don't always have, but thankfully, because of God's Word and His Holy Spirit, wisdom you can get. Welcome to our series where five preachers tackle 10 topics with one goal to help you get wisdom. sermon on money? Come on. Come on, put your hands together. This is... I don't have to preach it. I don't have to preach it. Now look, you were afraid to clap because you're like, what's he, he's, he's going to sucker punch me. <laughs> you know, what's he going to do here? Where's he going? Look, look, I know you love money because you interact with it every day and you may, you may, you may be in a love hate relationship, but you got to deal with it. We should talk about it. So this is where we're going. Four principles for financial freedom. Here's the roadmap of where we're going to go together this morning. Three questions we will ask. The first question is, what is financial freedom? Let's get a, get a definition on the table so we can understand the goal that we're supposedly attaining or are moving towards. Second question is, why is it a worthy goal? In other words, if we know what it is, then the question becomes, is it worth working to get there because it will require sacrifice, it will require thoughtfulness, it will require foresight, it will require planning. You'll have to do a little work. Nobody trips and falls into financial freedom. Can you say amen? Amen. You won't get there accidentally. You will need to get there if you get there intentionally. So we'll talk about whether or not it's a worthy goal, which I think it is. And then lastly, we'll look at how do we obtain it, and that's where we'll impact the four principles for financial freedom. Now, I need to throw out some opening remarks before we move on, just to make sure I can address every... Now, look, this, this is blocking your view of my face, and I'm sure that's causing you a lot of heartache, so I just want to help you out there. Okay, there we go. Okay, opening rem- remark number one. Number one, first thing out of the gate, relax, I don't want your money. <laughs> okay? I just feel the need to say that. No, I, I love money, I love earning it, saving it, investing in it, giving it, uh, spending it, uh, being generous with it. I love talking about it. I, I love money because money is one of those things that I can, that's an objective, measurable tool that can help me figure out where my heart's at. But I realize not everyone is there in their enjoyment of the topic of money. And it might be because you struggle with it. Well, all the more reason to talk about it. Now, I want to say this out of the get-go because uh, th- this isn't about me getting your money. Don't flatter yourself, <laughs> okay? Like, like Grace City Church is doing fine. We're operating in the black because we employ these principles. And by God's grace, your generosity is, is moving mission forward. So this isn't me showing for money. This is me having a heart for you to experience financial freedom where maybe there's currently bondage, okay? I had a person tell me this week, yeah, so-and-so, you know, so-and-so came to church? I said, oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, they came on Sunday and left. I was like, oh, why is that? He's like, oh, uh, he said, all you wanted was his money. <laughs> I was like, really? What was I preaching on that Sunday? He's like, marriage. <laughs> I'm like, okay, uh, how, did he, uh, how did he get from a sermon on marriage to Josh wants his money? I think that might be more about his issue than mine, <laughs> but that's another story. The point being, if you're here and not a believer, or this isn't your church, I don't want your money. This is me attempting to help you deal with something you face every day and that oftentimes causes challenges. This is the unspoken elephant in the, in the American room, okay? We've proven statistically over and over again as a culture, we don't get how to handle money properly and responsibly. And therefore, the people that we elect don't do it either, and we're all in a huge mess. And so I believe it's God's will for your life to experience financial freedom, and I want to lead us into that because the church should be a people markedly out of step with the culture in relationship to how we think, feel, leverage, spend our money. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. You're as bad as first service. This, uh, this is good stuff. Amen? Amen. Okay, come on. Here we go. Wake it up. Open remark number two. If you don't get money right, nothing else works right. I'm not saying that money is the most important thing in your life. 
I'm just saying if you don't get it right, it will mess up everything else in your life. And so let's not elevate it to like the most important thing, but let's not ignore it as not a big deal. If you don't get the money right, nothing else will work in your life, I guarantee it. So it's worth talking about. In fact, Jesus talked about money five times more than he talked about prayer. Pretty interesting, isn't it? You think, well, if you're spiritual, you should talk about prayer. Apparently, according to Jesus, if you want to be spiritual, you should talk a lot more about money. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he's interested in your heart, so he wants you talking about your treasure. Last opening remark, number three, these principles are universal and scalable. So I want to be as practical as I can today, um, but I also realize I'm talking to a wide variety of experiences and socioeconomic statuses, so I want to teach in a broad enough spectrum that will apply to everyone. So what I'm going to talk to you about this morning is universal. It's for people living in any time or day, and it's for people in any scale of income. So whether you have, you know, make $35,000 a year or make $3.5 million a month, this, this, these principles work, okay? So I don't want you thinking, well, I, I don't make very much money, so these, these don't apply. No, these apply all the more. I don't want you thinking, oh, I make a ton of money, I'm okay. No, actually, you're probably in more risk than you know. Statistically, in America, the more money that is made, the less responsible the people are with that money. In fact, wealth never lasts more than two generations in our, in our nation, statistically speaking, typically. So it, it, whether you're making a ton of money, you know, right in the middle, or, or no money at all, or a little, a little money, these principles are universal and apply to you, especially, I won't say especially, it applies to all of you, okay? There you go, that's all I'll say. So question number one, what is financial freedom? Well, here's first what it's not. Financial freedom is not defined by the toys in your garage, <laughs> okay? So the goal here is not to see how much stuff you can accumulate, okay? And oftentimes we... We look around and we go, well, they must be financially free. Look at all the stuff they have. Now, I want to be careful here. God does not care that you have stuff. He does care if your stuff has you. God doesn't care if you got stuff. He's concerned if your stuff has you. And so I'm coming along and saying, okay, if financial freedom is the goal, which I think it should be, God's word says the financial freedom is not defined by the toys in your garage. If I drive around town often, because I live here, okay? And I drive around, and regularly I think, that, where did they, that's a huge truck. How could they afford that? And look at that gigantic boat out in front of that really tiny house. You know, I'm, I'm like, how do these people afford all these things, right? And then, and then I remind myself, statistically speaking, th- they can't afford it. They're leveraged to their eyeballs. And let me tell you, my dear friends, that is not financial freedom. You will not find freedom by accumulating more toys. So the goal here isn't to help you accumulate more toys because that's not our definition of financial freedom. Financial freedom is not determined by the ability to acquire money. Some of you think, well, I just need to make more money. I'm not against making more money. I'm not against um, you know, working hard and advancing. All the yes and amen. But, but if your budgeting strategy is just to make more money, you'll never experience financial freedom because you're standard of living will always rise to the level of what you're making. If acquiring more money was one of the key principles to financial freedom, then every schmuck who signed a professional sports contract would be financially free. And sadly, the 27-year-old post-professional sports athlete who's broke is cliche in our culture, right? Right? I mean, you do a study on professional athletes across the board, baseball, basketball, football, the, the, the exception to the rule is the man or woman who's managed their finances well and are living in financial freedom. The, the rule is the 27-year-old, the 35-year-old, the 45-year-old who had a ton of money and not a lot of biblical principles and is currently a slave to what they used to think would set them free, namely money. So financial freedom is not determined by the ability to acquire money. I'm not against acquiring money. Neither is God. Go for it all all, all you can. Just don't think that's the key principle to financial freedom. Financial freedom is you controlling money as a steward rather than it controlling you like a slave. Recognize there are only two ways to relate to money. Either you will relate to it as a steward, meaning it's not mine, but been given to me for a period of time to leverage, invest, and spend on the behalf of someone else, or you'll relate to it as a slave. There are no two ways about it. 
Either you're a steward of it or you'll be a slave to it. And if you want to be free, you better view it as, as a steward. If you don't view it as a steward, then you view it as yours. And when you view it as yours, you start spending it like you're not accountable to anyone. And that's the trail to slavery. Financial freedom is the ability to follow Jesus wherever he calls you to go and do whatever he calls you to do. This is, this is my definition. When Sharon and I got married, I was 22, 23. She was much older. And uh, <laughs> about like a year or two, I think. I, don't know. I, I married an older woman, that's right, marrying up. I had to find somebody older to match my maturity level is how I think about it, really. <laughs> I can say these jokes because my mom isn't here or she'd be throwing something at me right now. So the second service is always a lot funner. A lot, I feel a lot more free in my spirit. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. I love my mom. Um, Sharon and I got married, and, and we began reflecting on the, the areas in our life that we wanted to focus on, sexuality, children, parenting, uh, um, career, path, calling, uh, where we're going to live, and finances. And we recognized that this is an area that causes oftentimes a lot of friction in relationships and is the reason why many people divorce. We wanted to get a handle on it. We wanted to, we wanted to be stewards, and, and we wanted to be responsible. And so we, we wrote out a vision, life statement, and relationship to how we would view finances. And I was going to bring it, and then I thought it might bore you, and now I kind of wish I had it. But from memory, it was something in effect of, we will view all of our resources as gifts from God to us that we're responsible to steward. We will make it our aim to live in such a way below our means as to put us on the path toward financial freedom so that we might be more free and available to respond to the call of God to go wherever he calls us to go and do whatever he calls us to do. That's the vision statement that we wrote for ourselves at 23 and 24, and it's been governing and guiding every decision we've made about money ever since. Because if we don't have an intentional plan to do with our money what we believe God's called us to do, we will then be in a reactionary position responding to all the demands and wants of life. And I guarantee you, if you're in that position, you're not going to be a steward of the resources God's given you, and you will not experience financial freedom. And one of the definitions of financial freedom for us is being free financially to go wherever and do whatever God might call you to do. The sad part of it is that many Christians today are strapped financially, and they're also strapped down missionally. They're not free to be generous. They're not free to go and do what God calls because of the foolish choices they've made in relationship to money. And so I I, I rise up and call Ron and Betty Bundy blessed, and I rise up and call Steve and Jackie Johnson blessed, and they're not here uh, with us right now, but when I was 23, 24, I reflected on their life. I realized, man, they were at all of my youth group retreats. They were, all, they were on all of our mission trips. Come to find out, they were helping fund some of those things. They were always free to step in and help and serve and give. And, 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 and why is that? And I realized it's not because they were multi-bazillionaires. It was because they had taken the little they had and done wise things with it so that they were free in their later years to, to not have to work nine to five, seven days a week. They were free to serve and bless and minister. And I thought, that's where I want to be when I'm 45 and 50. And so I took them out to dinner with Sharon, the top of the roaster over here, and I asked them, I want to get where you're at. How'd you get there? And they opened up their books and opened up their lives and opened up their story. And they told us how they went about it. And every story is unique according to your means and your gifts and your abilities and your experiences and your passions and gifts and callings. I get it. But there were gen- general principles I pulled out of their life. Did the same thing with Stephen Jackie. And then I would go and I regularly find people who are further down the path that I want to be on and go, how'd you get there? Not for the sake of, of padding my security blanket so I can, you know, play more at the end, but for the sake of walking the road of financial freedom so the older I get, the more available I can become to respond to the call of God. Is that a good aim for us as believers? Oh my goodness, absolutely. What, a, what an admirable thing to move towards as a follower of Jesus. I want to live and leverage and spend my resources that I might be increasingly free to respond to the call of God. Whew, I get excited about that. And that's my heart for you as well. So that's how we're going to define financial freedom. Question number two, why is financial freedom a goal worth pursuing? Lots of things we could talk about here. I'll just hit a couple high points. Number one, according to Proverbs, financial freedom prepares me for a rainy day. For a raining day. Rainy day. You know, you know what I mean. Financial freedom prepares me for a, a, a raining day. <laughs> it still works. Proverbs 10, verse 15, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. What's he saying? The wealth 
of the rich is like a fortified city. What does a fortified city have around it? A wall. That wall is built for the purpose of protecting the city from unforeseen attack against those inside. And that's what financial stewardship and financial freedom brings. There will be things coming that you can't anticipate and that you can't plan for. And when you've been a steward of your resources, generally speaking, you can insulate yourselves from those unforeseen attacks so that now you're no good to anybody. I oftentimes chuckle. I hear people say, oh, we're just, we're just really strapped this, this month. Why would it happen? Oh, we, we, got, we got our insurance bill this month, you know, our life insurance policy every six months. I'm like, but you knew that was coming, right? Well, I know, but, I, but I, oh, I mean, it just came out of the blue. Or, you know, like, oh, we had to make our car payment this month. The one that comes every month on the 6th. You know what I mean? Like, like when you're acting surprised at things that, like, told you they were coming, your city will not stand very long. If you can't defend against the enemies who, who called ahead and said they're coming, <laughs> you, you won't have a shot at defending your city against those that snuck up on it. Well, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but poverty is the ruin of the poor. The second reason why financial freedom is a worthy goal is that financial freedom positions us to be genuinely generous. To be genuinely generous. Proverbs 19, verse 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. When you give to the poor, who are you giving to? The Lord. Or Proverbs 21, 13. Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. Don't you just hate that verse? (laughs) How you relate to the poor and respond to their needs will directly correspond to how God responds to your needs when you ask. Because in relationship to God, you're poor. I don't care how much you have. Or Proverbs 29, 7, the righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Here's the point. God is a generous father who sacrificially, generously sent his son, his his prized possession, who left all the riches of heaven to come down and divest himself of those riches to make himself poor, to win for us a victory we could not win for ourselves. If we in turn then follow God the Father and claim the name of Jesus and yet live a stingy, greedy life, he will have words with us. Because he did not sacrificially spill his blood so that we could be misers with our money. And I want to speak to this because in how we relate to generosity um, speaks to our, uh, how much we trust the Father. And, and, and a sidebar, in, in, this, you know, in this global village we live in called the Internet, what can oftentimes be very challenging is we're made aware of more needs than inter- any group of humans in the history of humanity. Think about it. You're, you're, being, you're being barraged with more information and more knowledge of more heartache globally than the world has ever had access to ever, which can have a shutting down effect, it, 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 at least if you're a small minded person like me. I mean, I take regular digital media breaks, not because it's a colossal waste of time, which most of the time it is, but because I just can't take it anymore. I don't have the capacity to have compassion for all the needs I see. And yet Jesus calls us to have compassion on the needs that we encounter. But when Jesus was talking, he was speaking directly to us in our immediate vicinity. For those that you see and can feel and can touch and can encounter, have eyes of compassion for them. And yet we have so many needs that we can become aware of because of the internet that what can happen is we stop responding. Either because our heart is hard or because we've put ourselves in a position where we couldn't respond even if we wanted to. Neither of which is the position that Christians should be in. So you need to ask the Lord to help keep your heart tender and soft to the needs that you see And then you need to remember that the needs I'm directly responsible for probably are those right around me. And then if there's a special calling to those outside my sphere of influence or my geographical location, I'll consider that. But that'll be the the unique and and unnorm. The the norm is, hey, those that you're around, in other words, I'm saying like, like, 
the Wenatchee Valley. Like, 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 like if there are needs to be met, let, let's as a church focus our first fruit attention here. And then let's think regionally and let's think nationally and globally, yes and amen, because that's God's heart, so we want that heart too. But let's not, let's not skip the first three and go to the last one and think we're being faithful. And, and so if, if you see needs and don't respond, check, is my heart hard or is it because I know I can't do anything about it because of choices I've made? Okay, and we, we, want, we want to be aware of either of those errors and respond accordingly in repentance. Or number three, the reason it's a worthy goal is that it just beats slavery to debt. Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. We could go on and on about this, but I hope I don't need to convince you that debt is dumb, okay? Almost all debt is dumb. There's some that I think is good, and okay, and even wise, but most of it, speaking of consumer debt here, is not healthy, and, and, and not, not something that you want to be pursuing or, or, or building up. And so pursuing financial freedom means that you're free from the slavery that debt brings when you're not making wise choices with your money. So here we go. How do we get there? Solomon's four principles of financial freedom. Are you ready to go? You ready? You ready for these? Come on, get fired up, somebody. I'll, I'll, I'll shut the service down right here. If you, I mean, I don't, I don't have, I, I, we can go home early if you want. You want to hear this? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Principle number one, if you want to get ahead, stop falling behind. <laughs> Not one amen. <laughs> I'm trying to put stuff on the bottom shelf here, folks, because that's where I need it. I'm, just, I'm, I'm a midget in this, kind of, in this area, and so I, got, I need stuff easy accessible. So principle number one, if you want to get ahead, stop falling behind. Thank you. <laughs> one Christian in the balcony. Now, we think this is simple, and yet you ignore it all the time. Say it with me, debt is dumb. Say it, debt is dumb. <laughs> okay, now, now I understand home debt, you know, some, some, uh, I, I get all that, I'm a part of that. I, I leverage, yes, yes, and amen. But a large majority of the debt that Americans get themselves into is consumer-driven debt, which is absolutely ridiculous. And I'm just here to tell you, you will never experience financial freedom if you are constantly putting things you can't afford on your card. This is an exhortation for you to trust the master, not your master card. You like that? I got more of those later if you like it. <laughs> God's calling you to trust the master, not your master card. Which means you, if you want to get ahead, you got to stop falling behind. I hear this all the time. People who stand in front of closets that are full of clothes saying things like, I have nothing to wear. My wife knows that those are not the words I respond to well. I don't have anything to wear tonight. Oh, really? Let me help you out here. This shirt, that shirt, those pants, this skirt. I mean, you know, really, really, really? You can wear that outfit, this outfit. I mean, I can wear it too. We go together. You know, I'm like, you have nothing to wear? I don't think so, Chica. <laughs> and like five minutes later, I'd be like, I got nothing to wear. You know, and she'll march in and preach the same sermon to me. Or stand in front of a fridge full of food going, like nothing to eat here. And so we go out and we keep spending and we keep spending and we keep spending. And newsflash, you will not get ahead if you keep putting yourself behind. So two words from Jesus' heart to your ears, stop it. Okay? Three words, knock it off. Four words, stop it, you stupid. <laughs> I mean, how many words do you want in, right? It's like this isn't hard. If you are in a pattern of spending, you need to stop. Cut up your credit card, throw it away, burn it at midnight, do whatever you got to do. You will never get ahead if you're constantly putting yourself behind. And one of the ways you get behind is you compare yourself to other people. More on that later. Here we go. Principle number two, save a little bit over a long period of time. Did that surprise anybody? I know this is really simple, right? How many people actually do this? Not very many. Proverbs 13, 11, Dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. The temptation is I will save when I'm done spending, and then the problem becomes you never stop spending, so you never start saving. You gotta start right now, no matter where you're at, taking a little bit, putting it away, and saving it, and you'll be shocked what a little can do over a long period of time. And I'm especially talking to young folks here. If you're high school, college, or you know, young marriage, or young singles, you need to get a vision 
for the power of this word called uh, a leverage and, and, and interest over time. You need to understand that if, check this out, this is mind-boggling to me. The average car payment in America today that the American makes, they rationally choose without a gun to their head to make this payment every month. $464. I've never and will never pay that much money a month for four wheels and a way to get around, ever. That's ridiculous. They spent, if you were 25 and took that $464 and just stuck it away every month when you're 65, $5 million. Hope you liked your car. Because you could buy Ford Motor Company. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like we got to have perspective here on time. And the reason is that we don't do it is it doesn't happen fast enough. Oh, I put 300 bucks away last month and then 200 bucks away this month. And all I got is 500 bucks. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? It's like, like, like baby steps here, you know, little, 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 little fella. If I could just exhort you, and, and, and I wish I had time to bring up some, some older folks in the room, like seasoned, you know, experienced folks, because I, I'm, I'm seeing faces even look out. God's faithful. When you put a little bit away over a long period of time, all of a sudden, like, wow, look what there is to work with. And there are many folks in our church who are experiencing that. So young folks, find an old folk and ask them questions. And, and, and find folks who are further down the road than you, how they got there. If, if they're generous with what they have, responsible and wise with what they've been given, you should be talking to them. I talked with someone last week about this. I'm going to talk about it with someone this week who I go to regularly and say, here's the books. Here's where we're at. Here's something unexpected we didn't see. Here's something that, that, that we chose to make a move on. Here's what we're thinking. Here's the income. Here's the savings. Here's some investments. Uh, here's some dreams we have. What do you think? And then I just open up my life and go, help me out here. I have nothing to lose as a steward. I'm going to be held accountable by this before God, so I'm going to put your name on this too. You know, help me out. What should I do? <laughs> right? Principle number two, save a little bit over a long time. Dishonest money dwindles away, but the one who gathers money little by little makes it grow. And man, if we had time to tell stories, this isn't about, put, this isn't about if I don't have $10,000 to put away a month, I'm not going to try. No, no, no. Take a little bit and put it away and watch it grow. Thirdly, Choose to live below your means. Proverbs 21, this might be the most painful one, so this will be fun. Proverbs 21, verse 20, the wise store up treasures and choice food, but fools devour all they have. Now, this has been a bit of a life verse for me and my wife and our family. It's, it, it's a life, it's a governing verse for our church and the protocols we follow financially. And like I said, again, this isn't me up here begging for money because we're in the red. No, Grace City Church, by God's grace, is in the black. We're doing fine financially because there are many gracious people giving generously. But I'm here to tell you, there is much more vision than we have resources to accomplish. There are many more dreams in our heart that we would love to do that we don't have the resources yet to pull a trigger on. We have more uh, opportunities to pursue than we have funds to pursue them. So what do we do? We live below our means. That's a conscious decision we've made at the church, so we're never here pressuring you. We're here inviting you to participate in the opportunities God gives us. And we believe very firmly it's our job to present the vision. It's your job to determine the pace. Because we can't force what, what you won't fund. And so we, we make the opportunity known for the vision God's given us, and then we walk at the pace you provide. And we choose to live as a church below our means. And so every year, we look at what we think will come in and where we're at from last year, and then we intentionally set our budget below that line. We take 10% and we give it off the top, so we're funding church plants and, and we support missionaries around the world. We do fun stuff in our community, like give cars away to Apple Blossom and support folks in need here in town. We've got something really exciting coming up for our law enforcement community that I'll make, uh, I'll make you aware of in a few weeks. We want to be good news to our city by stewarding our collective resources in, in such a way that allows us space and margin to, to, to bless our city financially. So we set aside 10% of the top, and then we create a 10% margin of savings so that we're always running on 80% of what we think will come in. We're never running, it, it's never a good year if a church just makes budget. If you like just squeak by it, that's not a good year. That, 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 you were on thin ice. And so we, we, now, when we put money aside in savings, 
we do two things with it. We, view, we have an emergency fund and an opportunity fund, and so should you in your own home. Because emergencies and opportunities, like Larry Osborne always says, have one thing in common. They never send a text message telling you they're coming. And so we have 60 to 90 days operations, uh, operation funds set aside. Just nobody touches it. It's just there in case the apocalypse comes, you know, and all of you die, we can operate for 90 days. <laughs> I don't know why we'd want to do that, but it's there, you know. It's like, <laughs> get some more folks in, 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 the, in the fold before we all go home. Apart from that, we have an opportunity fund, and we're, and we're regularly uh, uh, putting money aside so that we're available and we're ready to act on an opportunity, whether it be real estate or, or personnel or something we want to do uh, in the city. In fact, I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think we've hired almost every person at Grace City since I started from, from the opportunity fund. Because we didn't know eight months ago to build it in our budget, we'd hire them because we didn't know we'd need them or they were available. So when they came available, and oftentimes you don't got a long time to pull a trigger, if we had like build it and wedge it into our operating funds, we couldn't do it. And so we lean in on the opportunity fund to float the balance of the year until we can build it into our budget for next year. And that allows us to take advantage of opportunities we would have missed had we been living to the margin of our lives. And so I'm not up here asking you to do anything personally that we don't do corporately as a church. Because I believe fundamentally that if you don't get the money thing right, corporately or individually, nothing else will go right. But God blesses the family, the household, the man, the woman, the church, that gets the money thing right, that stewards the resources of God well with an eye to his kingdom and a heart for their community. And so my, 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 my challenge to you is choose to live below your means. So the first step was what? You won't get ahead if you keep putting yourself behind. And so that's attacking debt. And you need to view debt like a, like, like a lion or a tiger in your two-man tent. Okay? You got the picture? So there's a man-eating liger. There's a man-eating tiger in your two-man tent. And the fool is like, oh, stupid zipper on my sleep bag is broke. That's how a lot of you are. You got this lion-eating, this man-eating lion tiger of debt in your, in your tent, and you're looking for your socks, you know? And like the, ti- the tiger is devouring you, you, speak. you need to wake up and you need to, you need to, everything becomes a weapon and you need to kill that thing. You know what I mean? It's like fight or flight. And that tent needs to be a boom, 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 boom. And then eventually out the door needs to go the lion. You need to beat it and you can if you get after it. You need to have that kind of tenacity to get after stopping the, the, the blood from draining out of your life and constantly going behind. And then you need to choose to live below your means. Here's why we don't. Here's why we don't. Because we regularly compare ourselves to those who we consider in our class. So if you're a teacher, you compare yourself to another teacher. If you're a truck driver, you compare yourself to another truck driver. If you're an attorney, you compare yourself to another attorney. If you're a pastor, you compare yourself to another pastor. If you're a stockbroker or an apple broker, you compare yourself to, to your peers. And then you look at their standard of living and go, well, I should be able to do that. And then what governs your spending is other people's decisions. How stupid is that? Say very. Good, good. Glad we agree. You don't know their life. Maybe they won the lottery. Maybe they got an inheritance. Maybe they're making more than you actually know. Or maybe they're just dumb and leveraging consumer debt to have a bunch of toys, and now you're chasing the dumb guy off the cliff. None of which makes any sense. In fact, I had the freakiest conversation. Is Daryl Ansley here? Wave your hand, Daryl. Is Daryl There he is. He's Daryl Ansley's right there. Love Daryl, godly man, full of wisdom, and he's helped us with a bunch of our, our loans and stuff over the years at People's Bank. I always send folks to him because I trust Daryl. So Daryl's walking us through this last, you know, uh, round of getting homes figured out, whatever, and, and, and he's explaining to me this HELOC phenomenon. Have you ever heard of a HELOC? Home equity line of credit. And he's explaining to me how it works and this and that, and I'm like, ooh, that kind of makes you a little nervous, and here's why, and we talk about it, okay, okay, and so we're getting things lined out, and, and as he's talking, I'm like, what do people use this for? He's like, all sorts of stuff. I'm like, what? He's like, vacations? I'm like, no. He's like, yeah. I'm like, what else? He's like, cars? I'm like, no. He's like, yeah. What else? Oh, toys? I'm like, no. He's like, yeah. I'm like, really? He's like, really? I'm like, can you believe that? He's like, no, I can't. This is ridiculous. He's like, I know. People are actually doing this, folks. They go to their home. They take out equity that is there, accumulate over the years, 
and they go spend it on non-assets, like vacations and cars. And I, and, and I, I said, Daryl, oh, I'm not killing your business here, Daryl. I mean, you know, but, but Daryl's like, yeah, he's like, I, I, I'm, I don't encourage it. It's crazy. I'm like, that is going to implode. He's like, yeah, I know. This is craziness. In fact, while, while I'm on this stump, you want to know the, about the, oh, the dumbest investments in town is to buy a new car. Nobody here should be driving a new car. Are you kidding me? Now, now, this isn't biblical. This is just me. So don't, you know, just, just let me vent here a little bit. Then I'll be okay. Driving new cars is the dumbest thing you can do. Why would you go spend 20, 30, 40, 50 grand on something that depreciates 20% in five minutes? You put down a bunch of money, you drive off the lot, boom, 15 grand down the rat hole of your image. That's stupid. I see these brand new 2022 Ford F-350s driving around town. And here's what I don't think. Cool. I think schmuck. That's what I think. (laughs) And that's what you should think. They're total schmucks. Are you kidding me? I mean, here's the deal. Rich people don't do that. Because they understand the principle of living below your means. And they didn't get to where they're at because they're going around buying new cars all the time. You shouldn't be buying a car that requires them to, you know, airlift apart from Germany to fix it. And that's just my personal prerogative. You know, not trying to promote American automobiles here, but, but maybe sub- subliminally. They're just a point being. That's one example, not biblical. Do whatever you want. I'm, I'm saying think about what you do and live below your means. I will never, well, probably never drive a new car <laughs> that I can foresee. Because I'm not going to spend that kind of money on four wheels to get me around town on something that's going to depreciate so quickly. I view vehicles as a liability. They're paying the rear, always breaking down. I just spent a grand in Les Schwab for like two tires. And I was like, are they gold plated? Good Lord. It's crazy out there. So you got to be aggressive and you got to live below your means. And if you're constantly looking at folks at your same class going, well, they got that and I got that, you have to make a conscious decision to live one step below your professional peers, if you're going to live below your means, is my guess. Do you know that the average American spends 136% of their income every year? That is not a tale you want to chase. Whether you make 30 grand a year or 3 million a year, that's not sustainable. Because financial freedom doesn't determine how much money you make. It's, it's determined by what you do with the money you make. Now, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to then be generous and, ha- and, and, and have margin and, and save you're probably going to have to live two steps below your professional peers. You okay with that? Or you're going to have to be if, 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 if financial freedom is what you want because we live in a world that's gone insane when it comes to trying to manage their money. Okay? Anybody's feelings hurt? I wasn't trying to like, you know, knock on people's feelings. I was just trying to make fun of those people who, <laughs> who buy new cars. <laughs> I'm kidding. Get a new car, I don't care. If God blesses you, awesome. Praise the Lord. That's not, don't miss the heart behind the point, right? Okay, here we go. Principle number three. Oh, no, I got, I, got a, I, got a, I got a something else in here. What do I got? Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, but the realization of what you already have. If you're going to live below your means, you've got to figure out this thing called contentment. Because if you're, if you're not content with where you're at, guess what more will bring? More discontentment. In fact, was it Rockefeller was asked, how much is enough? And he responded with, just a little bit more. So if you're not content with what you have, getting more won't make you more content. It'll just make you more discontent for more things. If you can't learn to be content with what you have, you won't live below your means. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you'd like to have one day. Oh, if I have that, then I'll be happy. No, contentment is the realization of what you already have and being grateful for it. Amen? Amen. Can we just acknowledge that every person in this room, if you ate a meal today, are probably ahead of like 99% of the world and, and, and are doing pretty good? That we can be content with what we have, church. God's calling us into financial freedom, and the enemy of that freedom will be discontentment and desire for more materialism. Last principle, number four. I've got to hurry up and be done here. Give to God's agenda off the top. Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with all the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. I've never met somebody who's financially free who hasn't gotten the principle of generosity. And these are God's principles, so they work whether you're a Christian or not. Even those who are not in the church and, and who are not Christians have this thing they call philanthropy that they do because God wired us to want to give. 
God wired us to want to be a part of solutions we see when we look out and observe problems. The, the, the church should be the, the exemplar of what it means to live below our means, to position ourselves, to be intentionally generous with what God's given us. And here's what first fruits means. Let me explain this because it might need some explaining. This was written in in an agrarian culture and so everyone lived off farms. Thankfully, we live in a farming community so we get that. But some of us, not all of us, depend on on the sustenance that comes out of the ground that we grow to to live our life on. So let me explain what, what this meant. In this culture, they couldn't control things technologically. They couldn't control things of the irrigation. They were dependent on, on the, the, the weather predominantly to kind of determine the harvest. And so harvest was a very risky thing. And every year harvest would come, and it was spread out over, over an extended period of time because oftentimes the, what they were harvesting had several harvests a year and because some places had lots of, of, of moisture, uh, uh, soil moisture and, and, and nutrients in, in the soil. And some places were low in valleys and did get as much rain and, and they got more sun. And so one person might be harvesting the same thing in multiple crops over an extended period of time. And what it meant was when they brought in that first wave of the harvest, that was to be given to the work of the Lord. And it was to accomplish two things in our life. The first thing was to accomplish was to cultivate gratefulness that we even have a harvest to, to, to bring in. And to recognize that that's a gift from God, not a result of, of my labor alone. The second thing it was accomplished to do what was to cultivate trust in the heart of that farmer. So that when I, when I take off this first harvest, I'm not even sure if I'll get the rest of this harvest, but I'm gonna take what I've taken off first and give that to the Lord to cultivate gratefulness to the one who's provided it for me and to remind myself that I don't live according to the strength of my own hand. But the, every breath is dependent upon God providing it for me. So this isn't just a financial strategy. This is a spiritual discipline towards godliness. Because the thing you often forget is to be grateful for what God's provided for you. And the other thing you often forget is to trust the one who provided it. And instead, trust your own hand. And so when we give up first fruits, meaning Sharon and I, we give off the top. We've never waited to the end of the month to see what we got left. We always and will always give first off the top. Because it reminds me to be grateful for what God's given and to trust him for what's yet to come. And my heart needs that discipline every month, every week, every day, because I'll, because I'll forget. And so in that way, giving becomes a means of grace to, to walk me into financial freedom. People who don't give just won't experience freedom. They won't. Because they'll trick themselves into thinking that the margin they created uh, uh, by not giving will allow them to get ahead, and it won't because they'll because they're not working for the principles that will get them ahead, because they're working from a set of principles that continually puts them behind. And so if you want to experience financial freedom, you got to employ these principles, and, and not the least of which one is to... Some giving should be done spontaneously. Most giving should be done intentionally, prayerfully, and, and, and planned ahead. That's why we don't do these big, you know, swelling moments of pictures of starving kids, and, you know, give, and you're crying, okay, I'll give. I mean, that's okay, you know, but... but I don't want to be a sucker to the slickest brochure that comes across my desk. I want to give in a way that is thought through, planned for, and prayed over. Because I believe that's the kind of giving that God God honors the most. So, do you got holes in your purse? You got a hole in your purse? You're like, I don't think so. I I mean, figuratively, do you got a hole in your purse? There's a story in Haggai I'll end with and be done. Haggai chapter 1, verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while my house remains a ruin? Here's the context for the story. God's house was in ruins and in shambles and being ignored, and the people of Israel were spending money padding their own pocketbook, building bigger houses, buying more houses, remodeling their new, you know, they're watching all these episodes of Fixer Up. They're like, hey, we could do that. A little ship lap, let's do that. So they're making their houses really nice and all this stuff. And to the, to, to, to the ignoring of the house of God. Verse five, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. And my exhortation to you, every person here this morning, give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have fill. You, you put on clothes, but you are never warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. And then he goes on to explain later in the chapter. Oh, and by the way, I put the hole in your purse. 
if you ignore me, I'll make it so that the money you kept from me in order to promote your own self will never satisfy what you thought it would satisfy. You got lots of drink, but you're still thirsty. Lots of food, still hungry. Lots of clothes, but never warm. Lots of houses, never satisfied. You got a purse with a hole in it, and I put it there. Your heart will never be full until you're intentionally posturing yourself to be a giver, not a taker. And so I have a simple question for you. What's your next step? And again, if you're here, not a believer, not Grace City Church, this isn't for you. You you just listen in. You take the principles that you think you can work with and and, and you ignore the ones you don't like and we'll see how it works for you. But this is for those who are here in the Grace City Church house. What's your next step? For some of you, it's going to be connected to, to principle number four. And you, you're, you're not giving anything, and God's going to say, I want you to go from nothing to something. That's a step. For some of you, you're giving something, but you need to go from something to significance. You need to give something of significance. And just to make sure we hit the smug crowd, as you're going, yeah, Pastor Josh, hit them. Hit that non-tithing crowd. For some of you, you need to go from giving significantly to giving sacrificially. Where you're choosing to go with things that you could easily afford because you're getting excited about a vision you're seeing of God's kingdom that you can help increase the speed at which it's accomplished. Now, again, I don't want you to feel any, any, this isn't pressure here. This is Josh wanting you to walk in financial freedom to posture yourself at a place where you can respond to the call of God. Because I'm telling you what, if there are those who are on that road, can you just give me a loud amen? Is it awesome being being financially free to respond to the call of God? Is it awesome? It is so good. It is so good, and I want that for you. So why am I teaching you to this? I'll give you this verse, and I'll be done. Did you know that I have verses in the Bible that you don't? Did you know that? That there are verses in the Bible that are just for me, not you. You can't have them. You know where they are? They're in the pastoral epistles in the New Testament, and Timothy's one of them. This is a letter written to pastors and how they are to lead the church. And so this is my letter. It's not yours. It's mine. And this is one of the things he tells me in that letter. Dear Pastor Josh, Pastor Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to rather put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now, one of my jobs is to convince you that you're rich. Because most of you hear that go, yeah, sock it to the 1%, the 1%. Sock it to him, Josh. And I'm here to tell you, if you make $49,000 a year as, as a combined inco- income for a household, globally speaking, you're in the top 1% of income earners. Can we just acknowledge that most of us here are, are in the rich category? Okay? And so this command is for you. And so I'm just telling this because Jesus told me to tell So Don't get frustrated at me. Send him an email. <laughs> command him to do good to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This sermon and series, of sermons, we talk about money often here because, because we're concerned for your eternal happiness. And we want you to be good stockbrokers and good investors of the resources that you have. That's why you should go talk with wise guys like Daryl Anthony and lots of other folks here in, in our church that can help you be stewards of what God's given you so you can regularly make investments with your resources that don't just bring an earthly return but bring an eternal return, amen? There is a return that's greater than what the stock market or the real estate market can give you. And use those things, yes and amen, leverage those things, absolutely. But do it for the sake of positioning yourself for financial freedom to more greatly and easily respond to the call of God to get on board what he's doing in the world so you can spend an eternity with your father rejoicing at what he invited you to participate in, namely using resources to move the kingdom of God forward. Remember, your father has all of the riches. When people say, oh, you owe my money, I'm like, I'm like, my dad's rich. I don't need your money. But you might want to consider where your heart is. Because my dad's rich, I will refuse to live like a pauper. And he's calling us to relate to money differently than the world does. He's calling us to have different kinds of feelings about money. Because he has freed us from the need to make money our God. And he's empowered us by his spirit to worship our God with the money he's given us to steward. Amen?
Father, I'd ask that you would be with this dear, precious group of people, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, increasingly give us wisdom to know how to walk in financial wisdom that would bring about financial freedom. Lord, that we could relate to money differently than the world does, that we would look at it as a, a resource to be stewarded. And Lord, where, where there are those who are, of us who are struggling with one of these principles or another, would you help give us the courage or the confidence or the clarity of mind to understand what it would look like to apply that principle to our life? And Father, I pray nobody would leave here with any sense of guilt, that everyone would leave here with a sense of of wind in their sails, that they're being called into a path that would lead them towards greater happiness, greater security, not just earthly security, but heavenly security. I'm investing investing in stocks that cannot be robbed. I'm investing in kingdom stock that will never fall or falter. In other words, you give all of us a vision, whether we're 20 or 40 or 60 or 80, to, to continue making decisions that increasingly postures us in a place that we would be freer and freer to respond to the call of God, that we would not shoot ourselves in the foot and that we would not shackle ourselves in slavery so that we cannot respond to the call of God, but that we would live in such a way as to free ourselves to respond to Jesus' leading as he calls us in Jesus' name. Let's stand together and worship the King of Kings who was rich, made himself poor, that we might know the richness and treasure of heaven and live like it here on earth.